Welcome to the No Limit Selling Podcast, where industry leaders share their advice on how you can become better, stronger, faster. Hey, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the No Limit Selling Podcast. Today, we have Michael Bridgman with us today, and I'm really happy he's got the time to talk with us. Oh, my, such a bad pun. I'm so sorry, Michael. Give us the 411 on you and your company. It's all good, man. So thank you, Umar, for having me on here. I'm very, very excited to be here. My friend, I've listened to some of your podcasts. They're great. You're doing, what is it? This I, You have episode, what, 325 up on your website? Something like that, yes. Ah, and yeah. my mom says they're all brilliant. Oh, well, at least your mom thinks so. That's fantastic. <laughs> so my friend, I, I am a longtime serial entrepreneur, so I've owned multiple different companies. And one of the things that I found was that marketing was always one of the greater challenges that I would run into whenever I was growing something. So I decided just to become good at it. And in so doing, I founded my own marketing and consulting agency called Time Marketing and Consulting, T-Y-M-E. And that actually stands for the Thank You Media Evolution, because I really believe that gratitude marketing and, and being mm-hmm. forthright and being just really realizing that the world is full of abundance and that we can all get what we want is a big premise of how successful people grow. Absolutely. And I think marketing is freaking voodoo, man. It's like, like it just seems like, you know, creating this thing and people should understand it and engage with it and they yeah. don't. And sometimes you create something that seems kind of crappy and all of a sudden it's just people are like, oh my God, I want this. And it's like, yeah, that's why you need people to help you. So why don't we define what marketing is? What is marketing? Because it's almost like a cliche. It's like such an overused yeah. word that people have lost uh, its meaning. So I, I think to me, it boils down into one, one word, one word only, belief. So marketing is the art of transferring belief. Love it. That's a great definition. The first time I've right. actually heard that. Is yeah. it your concoction or did you beg? No, us? that's. That's just kind of over my my decades of being in the entrepreneurial world and bleeding yeah. and sweating and, yeah, and, and suffering on the grinding wheel. Yeah, that's just kind of what I've boiled it down to. Whenever I'm talking about marketing, if I can frame it by going, look, our objective here is to transfer belief. That's what we're doing. Everything. And that's, that's a really wide, obviously, umbrella. But I think that's fundamentally what marketing's purpose really, okay, really So is. let's uh, kind of take a slight tangent. Tell me about the relationship between belief and trust. Mm. I think they intersect and they connect in a certain way. Like, so I'll frame it up. Like sure. my uh, fiance, who's going to be my wife next week. <laughs> <laughs> Does she know? That's the question. Yeah. Her name's Sheena. So she uh, might know. I don't know. So uh, when she buys something, she really looks at the Google reviews or the Amazon reviews Yep. And that's her way of transferring belief that I, I really trust this. So this a connection with trust and belief, what do you think that relationship is? It's a great question, Umar. I think that as, as someone who's building a product or an offer and you want people to buy it, you have to do two predominant elements of belief. You have to firstly get them to, well, there's really, there's three. There, firstly, you have to help them believe that what you're offering is going to be the solution they're looking for. So that's one notch of trust that, okay, I want to, you know, buy this product on Amazon, be it a pair of shoes or whatever it is. They're going to make me feel the way I want to feel. Therefore, I have to believe in the product. I have to believe in the actual vehicle or the tool or whatever it is that you're offering, whether it's coaching services, marketing services, uh, whether it's consumer products, whatever it is, the prospect the lead has to believe that what you're offering is going to deliver the result. That's the first primary belief that we have to cross. And that's where the trust in the conversation begins, right? So that's the first step in this bridge that we're building is they have to believe in the product. The second thing they really have to believe is in themselves achieving the thing that you are offering them. So yes, that pair of shoes looks fantastic on that woman. But why is it going to look fantastic on me? I believe they can look fantastic on someone, aka the model, whoever it is. But how is it going to look fantastic on me? Right? Mm. So it's, uh, you know, I'm a big believer. I love German cars, my friend. I love German cars. So I drive an Audi. And 
I know I can see other people driving their Audis and go, ah, see, I want that feeling. That's going to feel really, look at how great that guy feels. Look at how great that girl feels. I mean, she looks like she's having a really good time, right? And so ultimately, then I have to go and test drive it. I have to get in the car and then build that trust that, okay, not only did it work for Umar and how he feels about it, but it's also working for me and how I feel about it. And then the last hurdle, I think, in this building of a trust bridge here and, and the belief system is they have to believe that what they're doing is going to match the value they're exchanging for it. They have to believe they're getting a better deal than what they're paying for. All right. Uh, makes perfect sense. So let's kind of break that down. We'll go to number two first. Because when people look at something, the mm. question they have to ask is, is it possible? So let's say it was hair growth. Is hair sure. growth possible? Michael is pitching hair growth. Is it possible? Then the second one is, is it possible for me is what you kind of yeah. articulated there. Yes. So there's two hurdles there. One, and it goes back to step one, believability, I guess, is do I believe Michael is delivering what he says? Yeah. yeah. So let's break down belief. So in order for me to believe something, so let's, so why don't you give me a product? Could be the Audi, could be something else. Uh, Sure. Let's let's go with we're we're here. We're on. You know, we're recording this. So here. So let's talk about microphones. Yes. Okay. Because you and I both know a lot about microphones. We do this for a living, right? We 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 use our mouths. We speak for a living. <laughs> so let's talk about microphones, right? So what is it that you would need to believe Umar about a microphone in order to want it? So I think the first thing would be is does it make a difference? A mic's mm -hmm. a mic. And yep. so that could be the first hurdle is no. Sure. I sound like this without the right microphone. No. Yeah. Yeah. Or you sound like you're really far away all the time when you're back at home. Yeah. all the time, right? Yeah. So I guess education's a portion sure. of what we do to build belief because people that are looking at this ad for microphones could be from a sound engineer mm -hmm. all the way to somebody who's novice is like, you know, it's not the the medium, it's not the technology, it's just the message. The words I'm saying are going to be so compelling that that's the most important. So certainly yep. there's a bit of education there. Yep. And then how do you balance enough education from not enough or too much? Well, so here's, here's how I'm going to pitch this back to you, Umar, because I don't think you choose that. Ah, as a consumer or the one delivering the message? I, uh, the one delivering the message. The consumer makes that choice. Yes. Because, you know, what, what did they get? The, I've seen the four different personalities and it's done in colors. It's done in birds. It's done in, you know, planets, whatever they are, right? The, the four different personalities, right? Okay. You know so the first person that, that came up with that? Hippocrates, the father of modern medicine. No, really? First documented person that says there's, you know, there's four categories. One of them was bile. And Michael, you might be bile. Probably most. One with the ether. But please go on. Okay. I love it. I love it. I'm definitely bile. Like, yeah. That's my wife. I'm bile for sure. <laughs> it's not um, a bad thing, apparently. <clears throat> no, no, no. But it's like, so yeah. I, I just don't, so the red personality, right? They mm -hmm. like to move fast, like to take action. The green personality likes to cross every T, dot every I, and examine everything to the nth degree to see if the power source is something they're comfortable with, right? Like everything about that microphone, they would investigate. Do I like the way it looks, feels? How does it do at this decibel? And they would research all that. That's what tickles their fancy to make a purchase, right? Whereas the red personality is more lines of, does it make me sound better? Is it going to get me to my result quicker? Great, I'm buying it. End of story. So I don't think as the marketers and the business builders, it's up to us when enough education has been reached. It's up to the consumer. And that's why content, like what we're doing right now, Umar, is so damn important. Because we produce every day. We put out every day. We rhythmically are, are posting and putting information up in the warm zone around our products. Yes. Sometimes it's deeply educational. Sometimes it's more surface. Sometimes it's anecdotal, whatever it happens to be. And at some interval, our audience decides, or a member of our audience decides, ooh, it's time. I want to investigate what Umar is offering. I want to know more about this microphone Michael's talking about, right? At some point in that process, they make the decision. So it's up to us to, as I like to put it, it's up to us to turn the open sign on, to kick open the front door, sweep out the vestibule, as it were, and say, I'm open for business and keep being there and being present until it suits them. 
So just adding to that, it's like so annoying being on this side of the equation. Like mm-hmm. it's a recent client come on board and Brian saw me maybe four years ago do a workshop. Okay. Nice. And has been following me intently for four years. And when the time was right, he said, hey, Umar, I've got this issue. I need some help. Can you help? Yeah. And as you're producing content, you have no idea how many people are doing that. Because very few no. people actually send you a comment saying, oh, like your stuff, keep it going. Yep. And so, yeah, you just never know. But you- And that's why it's, it's like people ask me, Umar, they, they say, you know, clients say, you know, because we have some content marketing bundles that we offer. And they'll say, well, how long is this going to take for me to get my first sale? And my answer is honestly, how long it ever takes. Like there's no, there's no, it would be irresponsible of me as a business operator to tell you it's going to be on the 28th day. It's going to be on the 23rd day. It's going to take three weeks because we don't know. It might take a week, might take 10 days. How much of an audience have you already built, right? How, how, how quick to consume is the product that you're offering? If you're offering a chocolate bar or a coffee, it's going to be far different than if you're offering a $10,000 mastermind program or something like that. Like yeah. there's, there's a different and things different, have different buying cycles, obviously, but it's all about, and people get to decide. It's like, you know what, Umar? I'd never, I don't know when the moment was that I fell in love with my wife. Mm. I know the moment I fell in love with my son. It was when he arrived because yes. I had no, like I, I, I loved him in concept before he showed up, but there he is well, five totally and a half years ago handed to me. And I'm like, my heart is, I have no idea what this feeling is, right? My wife grew the baby. So she was a little more accustomed to what this is, but, but me, I was like, oh, son, instantaneous difference. So there's, there's two different kind of things that happen to us in our lives. There's like this immediate experience where something happens traumatic or wonderful and your life is changed. It will never be the same. Right. But when you fell in love with your fiance, right? Soon to be wife. When I fell in love with mine, I don't know when the moment was. Right. I don't know whether it was, okay, after, you know, 1,832 days, that's when everybody felt like, we don't know that thing. We just know that at some point we wake up and we are that person. So I'll give you a, like a product example of exactly what you said. Yeah. Uh, do you remember at all, this is ancient times, something called a Palm Pilot? Yeah, I know Palm Pilots for sure. I had Somebody one. You showed me that as it came out. Okay. And I probably sold 10 of them before I ever purchased one. Nice. Because I was telling people, oh my God, this thing's like so amazing. And a whole bunch of people bought it on my say so. And then I ended up getting it like a month later. But uh, that's an example of instant. I know I want it. Yeah. We'll go. And so definitely. So that's, uh, so we've got three things belief, it's themselves. Is it possible for me? And then the value. Let's take a look at the value equation because value really depends on. So I'll give you an example. One of my earlier podcasts, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I was interviewing this guy who's a sculptor. And some of his work has actually been on Game of Thrones. He's like, does metal. And he's like, totally talented. Fair enough. And he was talking about in his early years, because the interview with him was all about the relationship of commerce and art. Because a lot of artists are like, you know, if you you charge too much, you're like a sellout. And you're not really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. They tell themselves. And so for if him, you take a commission, you're a sellout. Yep. I've yep. heard it. And so my first career was as an actor. So I was a live oh, wow. performer and, and, and performed in movies. That was my first career. And there was a big, el- even in that industry, there's a big element of going, oh, you're going to do that project for that big, huge theater company or that big movie company. It's not an indie film. Are you going to sell out to the, like, like, I got to put food to thing. the man. Yeah. So okay. this guy was telling me about going to the show. It was a three day show at this festival and nothing had sold. And it was okay. a rainy last day. And this guy came up to his booth and looked at one of his sculptures and said, how much is that? And he goes, it's $15,000. And the guy goes, $15,000? Our hero, the artist is like, holy shit. I've, I better discount so I can sell something and get this guy. He's outraged by the price. But what the guy was feeling was, oh my God, it's such a deal for $15,000. What a price. Yeah. So luckily, our hero didn't say anything because he was so flummoxed by the guy not wanting to pay that much. And the guy said, I'll take it. And it was a good example of we map over our reality on others when we should not. But mm-hmm. his value for what he was selling, he felt guilty selling it for $15,000. And the other guy valued it like this is a $30,000 piece. I can't believe I'm getting it for fifteen. Yeah. And so how do we... How do we influence the 
perceived value from our customers because it's not going to be everybody, but we should have a sense of a hypothesis of this is our ideal customer or this is the kind of customer I want. Mm -hmm. And this would be the problems they have. And I want to solve one of those problems and increase the value of my offering in their eyes. So give me an example from your world, like a client you helped or one of your products that you really got that formula right. So, well, the one of the ones that we're really nailing right now is the one of the content bundles that we put together. So it's called the 30 and 30. And essentially what it is, is we we help a small business owner create 30 short videos. They film and then we edit. We do all the processing. We make them all cool and we make them move around. We add all the graphics and the B-roll and then we post them all for them. So it's a massive time saver for the client. Yes. right, Huge time saver. So they're able to, in four or five hours in a month, bang out 30 to 35 videos, right? That are all very short, very on point. And then we do all of the rest of the work. Mm. And how we priced that product was that I essentially just looked at, <laughs> this is sound strange, but I looked at some generic numbers of what business owners pay themselves as an hourly rate. Nice. Love it. Right. So I just, to me, part of some of this is science. Some of it is art. Right. And those two things coincide quite often. But in this case, I was like, okay, so what's the data points here? And it turns out most entrepreneurs pay themselves in around $52 an hour. Okay. That's a good number. Right. That's the general rule across all of the United States. I didn't look at Canada, uh, which is where I'm at, but that was the United American. I think that, and I think it was 2021 or 2022. I got the staff from a camera, but it was about $52 an hour. And so I just realized, okay, we're saving, right? Somewhere in around, what was it? I think it was about 50 to 60 hours of time yeah. in doing this work for these people because they're so Dude, slow. Being right? 2,500 bucks, thereabouts. Yeah. So then we priced the product at $2,000 because it was like, they're going, okay, I want a deal. I want to get better than what I would cost me to do it myself. Hmm. Right? So- they get a deal, right? And so it winds up being, they're looking at, yeah, two and a half to $3,000 worth of time investment from their perspective. They get it for two grand. And in fact, we sold our first six clients on it for only 1,500 and then it started to go up from there just to get the product That's moving. do it is to right? just, I remember starting a consulting company and the first client was $3,500 a month. Mm -hmm. And after that one, they became a testimonial and it went up to 6,500. And yeah. so yeah, great way of doing it. So yeah. I love that. That's a good way to come up with pricing. What's what's your time worth? And what are we saving you? And what's the value we get? That's right. You at the end. And, and then give them a deal. Make it, I'm a huge believer in the Godfather offer. Like make them an offer so good they cannot refuse, right? So I'm a big believer in coming up with a Godfather offer that solves not only the core mm -hmm. challenge that you're solving, but also the warm zone around that. So what would be a preemptive challenge that they're going to be facing that would get them to move forward? And then what would be something that I learned this from Dean Graziosi, solve the problem that's after the yes. Like what happens after the yes? There's a whole cascade of challenges that someone faces even after they say yes to your product, right? Like in the car world, again, I'm there, I'm in the dealership, I'm buying the Audi and this has changed now across the industry. But before it would be a big challenge to have to go get the insurance, right? Right now they've solved that problem. The insurance agent just shows up right in the actual, right in the, in the, 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 dealership. the dealership. There's the word I'm looking for. Thank you. Right. So they solve that problem. And here's the next, we're going to detail the car for you while you wait. They're going to, they do all of these things that are the, after the yes. Okay. I'm buying the car, but you know, how am I going to finance it? Well, we have a financing department. How am I going to get insurance? Here's your insurance person. How am I going to get the car clean? Here's, we're going to clean the car for you. What am I going to do with my old car? We'll buy it back from you. Like they solve all these downstream mm -hmm. problems, right? And make it so that when you walk into a car dealership, it's very difficult to walk out not wanting to buy something because they make the process so easy. Love it. So you had the three things, belief, themselves, and value. So I'm going to add a fourth one there, which is probably intrinsic in there, or it's just the next step of the process. Sure. Is commitment. So yeah. Michael, we're not dating anymore. I'm committed. We're like going steady, a promissory <laughs> ring. So how do we get that commitment? So once we've got a client, because all too often client companies, you know, we'll send out the email to stay in touch, but it's more like a check off the box. I need to do this, but how do mm -hmm. you build a relationship where you get that commitment that just makes the yeah, great question valued and also 
they become a really good referral source if they really believe in you. Yeah. So first of all, you have to have a really kick-ass product. Mm. Fundamentally, if your product sucks, if you're watching this or listening to this right now, it stinks. You got to work on your product. Like that's that is fundamentally the 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 base root answer to all of those questions. Amar is if their product is part of my language. If it's shitty, then it's they're not going to get anywhere, right? Like if your product sinks, then people are going to find out about it and they're not going to want to buy it. That's just game over, right? And you get into a commoditization, so you're just driving to the bottom of the barrel. There's no profit there. There's no wiggle room, right? So there's no point in making a crappy product. So if your product isn't great then keep working on your product. If you know, instinctively, I'll bet, whoever's listening or watching this right now, Umar, they know in their gut whether they're happy and satisfied with their product yet or not. Right. Agreed. Right. So that's that's number one. The second thing is momentum. So for me, building quick results. However, if your product takes six months to deliver, that's a long time frame. Like that's a really long lag time. So that means in the first 14 days, in the first 21 days, I would lay out your product and how can we get them the most successful wins possible? Like if I want to, you know, I've got a little bit of extra tummy weight around here right now. So if I want to lose that. I was going to mention that, but I I don't want to be rude. Yeah, well, (laughs) (laughs) well, thank you for noticing, I guess. (laughs) I'm working on it, Umar. I'm working on it, man. (laughs) So if they want to, you know, if I want to lose this, the fitness trainer says, well, it's going to take us 90 days because we've got to do certain things, right? What are, what are the wins in the first two weeks that he can then point back to and go, look, look at the results you're already getting. I know it's a 90-day process, but you're already getting results. So I think quick wins is important right afterwards. Like what can you do within the first couple of days even, or even first few hours to make sure that that purchase they just made is being solidified? Because the buyer's remorse is a real thing. Like we questioned what we just, we opened our wallet, we, we tapped or swiped or we ever did, we put our card number in and immediately we go, okay, I just spent $2,000 on that. What the heck am I getting for it? Is this really going to work? Right? So I think that's important. So first of all, have a great product. Second of all, build quick wins, build momentum. So that they're carrying forward. Hmm. And then the next thing that I would, uh, I encourage all my clients to do is have a like a regular check-in process, be it something that you do as a, you know, some clients in the coaching industry or something like that, they have Q and A sessions they do every week, right? Jump on, do Q and A's, or they interview some of their students. And like, even it helps to show, it's funny because it helps for other students, but also the student that's being interviewed feels so good about what, what's going on. Even if they they could have felt crappy about it yesterday. You interviewed them today on Tuesday, Umar, and afterwards, like, oh my gosh, I did make the right decision. No, I'm on top of the world, right? Because the coach or the the educator is putting them on a pedestal and showing how the progress they've made and and reiterating the value they're getting. So regular check ins are really really important. So the the oh, what was I getting at here? The cl- no, what did I say? The, <laughs> I've lost my train of thought, buddy. I said so a commitment. Yeah. So when you got the commitment, so ultimately the, that initial buy-in, right. Getting those fast wins. Oh, great product. There's us. It's got, got to be a great product. Ironic. I forgot that one. Got to be a great product. You got to have fast wins and then you have to have a strategic and structured check-in process that you're, you're managing with those clients on long-term. And then before they finish up. So before you wrap up, whatever your offer is, that's when I ask for testimonials. That's when I ask for referrals is but just before, like at the 90%, at the five yard line, that's where you ask for those things, right? Because they're really excited about the final results and they're just at that precipice point. There's a lot of energy and there's a lot of positivity. There's a lot of excitement around that. Yeah, right? Anticipation, they could taste it. So that's when I structure in and it's very systematic for me. So We just build it right into the software that we use that at certain intervals, they're getting those responses and it just makes life easier. It's happening. It's automated. And I don't have to, it's not me personally reaching out. It's just going out. Oh, love it. And I think setting up the expectations right at the beginning of this entire process in terms of here's some testimonials, by the way, these testimonials happened at the tail end of their Mm -hmm. experience and I'll be doing the same with you. And that kind of future paces it and sets the expectation and I love that. Michael, this was like a fascinating conversation. We're going to have more of these because I think it really added value to who cares about the listeners. It added value to me. And that's what counts. <laughs> this, this, 
<laughs> I love it. I love it. Oh, you're very welcome, Omar. And the one thing I just wanted to say too is, is about trust because you're asking about that at the very beginning. So to kind of tie this back around, yeah. I think for the most part, the prospects that we tend to work with, both you, me, and a lot of other people, they've lost trust in themselves. Right. Right. It's not that they don't trust that someone's brand is going to do something. It's not that they don't trust. These. I think inherently a lot of people trust that a product makes a claim and it's going to be relatively what that is. I think people have lost a level of trust in their ability to get what they want as a result. They've bought the car and it doesn't feel the way they expected it to. They've bought the shoes. They don't look the way they expected to. They've purchased the coaching program and they didn't get as much out of it as they wanted to. And so I think one of the fundamental things is the people that win, like the business owners and the entrepreneurs that really succeed, they spend a significant portion of their creative energy and capital on helping those people build self-trust and self-belief rebuilding the idea that, you know, if I'm going to look like all of their frameworks and their messaging and everything else is about building, rebuilding that person's self-confidence, rebuilding the trust that they have in themselves to look the way that that woman looked in those shoes, to feel the way they feel in that. Like, like a lot of what you see with great companies, they are building the ideal client with their messaging and their marketing. They're carving you into existence. They're, they're really yeah, making that yeah. person into their ideal client. It was and I think that's important to remember. I forget the name of the show. It was a show about this, uh, the queen of the South. Mm, and okay. there's a line in there where this woman gives our heroine a dress to wear to this fancy party. And okay. as they're walking up into the door of the party, the older lady goes, are you going to continue to let that dress wear you? Or are you going to wear that dress? Mm. And it's all about that trust in oneself and the confidence and the chutzpah it takes to just show up in the way that you know you should. Uh, Michael, we're going to put all your contact information in the show notes, but before we depart, why don't you articulate where, be, where people can find you? Yeah. Yeah. So Michael Bridgman, I'm all over Facebook and in a good way. Uh, on michael.time, I believe T-Y-M-E is the TikTok or, and the Instagram. I think that's what those are. And then if you want to join us, we have a free Facebook group. So it's called the Marketing Wizards Inner Circle. Love so you it. can jump on there and grab it. And there's a YouTube channel that marries that. So Marketing Wizards Inner Circle is the YouTube channel as well. Michael, thanks so much for being on the show. Really enjoyed it. Let me do the outro and then let's chat for a few minutes. Sure. If you enjoyed this episode, please go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. And if you're looking for more tools, go to my website at nolimitselling.com. I've got a free mind training course there that's going to teach you some insights from the world of neuro-linguistic programming, and that is the fastest way to get better results. 